All right. Brother Barry, would you open us up, please? Our Father, we bow in your presence. We're thankful to be here. We ask now that you'd open our hearts. I pray you touch my brother. I pray you put a hedge about him. Lord, I pray you take your precious word, Lord, and let us receive it into our hearts. My Father, to feed us, to feed the inner man, I pray you would prep us, get us ready for the worship service and for all that you do. We'll be very careful about our worthy heads. We'll give you the praise for it, which in Jesus, blessed his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, and verse 6, if you will. We left off last week in Romans 1, 5, talking about the obedience to, to the faith. So obedience is connected with faith. We covered that in pretty great detail. Um, but now we're going to move on to 1, 6. Now this is the opening dedicatory, if you will, that Paul, he does in all his epistles. And he, he writes to certain individuals or certain churches. And you'll, he'll always have this kind of style in his, in his writing. Um, and that's what you see here. And so we'll, we'll get through this um, first part of the chapter, hopefully this time around. Um, one thing I do want you to understand, though, is from um, the perspective of how it's kind of broken down in the first couple chapters, uh, you'll see here that uh, as we get down to verse 17, he's, Paul's going to be talking about how God dealt with the Gentiles before the law, okay? And so what was taking place before the law uh, or I'm sorry, before Jesus Christ shows up, okay? So this whole kind of argument Paul's laying out here, he's talking about how God dealt with the Gentiles after he gets through with this opening dedicatory. And then from about uh, two, uh, chapter 2 and verse 17, he begins to deal with the Jew, how God dealt with the Jew, okay? And we're going to be going through a lot of different things here, doctrinal things that you need to keep in mind. Um, and so there's some things in here that we'll, we'll have to discuss and deal with um, I don't want to get too much into kind of advanced theology and uh, some things like Calvinism you have to deal with. A lot of those things, a lot of the things you have to deal with, you have to deal with some of the arguments uh, against what the biblical doctrine is and you have a lot of theology or systematic theology or Calvinism. I don't want to get too much into that because I don't want you to be drowning. I just want you to get the overall understanding these first two chapters, what the context is. Chapter 3 you'll see that he's dealing with everyone. Everyone's in a mess, okay? For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God, okay? So that's the reason that Paul's kind of writing this, okay? So he says, uh, verse 1-6, he says, Among whom also are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, okay? So we got this term here, the called. The called. Can you see that better now? Okay. All right, so look at Romans 8.28, a very familiar passage. People like to use this verse a lot. You've got to keep things in context. Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Okay? So you have to keep, when it says many, all, everywhere, all those kind of things, you have to keep that in context. So... When you're looking at that verse right there, um, all things work together for good. Okay, well, what about um, a man cheating on his wife who's a Christian? Does that work together for good? No, right? He's talking about all things according to his purpose. Look, to them that love God, well, he said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. All right, love not the world, neither the things in the world. Love the brethren. Okay, those, those commandments that the Lord Jesus Christ gave when he was here on this earth, plus, you know, the, 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 not to mention the Old Testament, the, the Ten Commandments there, okay, the Decalogue, as you'd call them, okay, be walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh. So you have to keep that in context, but he says, who are the called according to his purpose. So everybody has a purpose if you are the called of Jesus Christ. God has a purpose for you, right? Look at uh, Acts six, uh, 26. Acts 26, this is Paul recounting his encounter with the Lord. Acts 26, 16, says, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things into which I will appear unto thee. Okay, this is the Lord Jesus Christ and on the road to Damascus. He, he appears to Paul. He's got a purpose for Paul, right? 
So according to his purpose, you're the called. So obviously if there's a calling, then there's going to be a need for that calling. Okay? So there's obviously a need for Paul to be called, or he wouldn't have called. Just like Samuel, right? Remember? The Lord called him. He answers the call. There was a need for Samuel to be a priest. Why? Because Eli, was, he was about done, and because of his, the sin his, his sons were committing, Hophni and Phinehas, and he wouldn't get on to them, he wouldn't rebuke them. Okay, the Lord said, I'm done with this line here. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Samuel, and he's going to be the next priest and judge and the last judge of Israel. Okay, so there was a need for that. There was a need for Moses, right? When he was called that burning bush, he went to the light. There was a need for Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. You see that? So there was a need. There's a need for saints. God has to have a bride. The Lord Jesus Christ needs a bride. Okay, just like in Genesis 24 when Brother Barry preached on Rebecca, There was a need for her. He called that a Gentile bride. There was a need for that. You understand? So if there's a calling, then there's going to be a need for that. Okay, if you're called to preach, or if you're called to teach, there's a need for that. Or if you're called with the gift of helps, which is one of the gifts that's never even talked about, that, hey, man, somebody has to scrub the toilets. That's not a menial thing. That's a, there's a need for that. And God looks at that thing. He doesn't look at that thing as far as uh, scrubbing the toilets. And he, he doesn't look at a preacher as, oh, they're better. No. No, the, the body has many members and many, many different uses for that, for those gifts and callings, okay? So, but there's a need for that. Somebody has to do those things, all right? It's like uh, in football, I mean, this is a sports analogy, but many times people always give praise to the quarterback, to the guys who handle the ball the most, but they never even pay attention to the offensive line. Well, if you didn't have an offensive line, none of these other guys would get the glory. Make sense? Okay? So there's a need for that, okay? And then there's also, if there's a calling, there's a need, there will be an ability, okay? Now, you may not think you have an ability to do whatever it is that God said that there's a need for, just like Moses. He thought, well, I'm not eloquent of speech, Lord, I can't. He says, you know, he says, you know, I, I can't do this, I can't do that. He didn't understand that the, the ability was there. But it takes the Lord some time to cultivate that ability. Gideon didn't think much of himself. David didn't think much of himself. Even King Saul didn't think much of himself when he started out. If he would have stayed that way, he'd been all right. Okay, but there was an ability that they didn't realize that they had. Okay, I, I, you've probably heard testimony from many of these preachers in here talking about when they were called to preach. Okay, I didn't think I had the ability to do that or the ability to teach the Bible. But God knew what was inside of me and inside of Brother Barry and Brother Ronnie and, and whoever else he's called to do those things. Pastor Lawson, okay, there was a need, there was an ability that they didn't even realize was there. Okay, so God pulls that thing out. Paul had the ability. Obviously, he did. Okay, Now, there's also going to be opportunity. There's going to be an opportunity to use whatever gift and ability God has given you. Okay? Um, I, can, I can speak from personal experience. I've never had to open a door. Not one time have I ever had to go and open a door somewhere to be able to minister uh, how the Lord has me minister, okay? Whether it's preaching or it's teaching, I haven't had to go around and say, hey, can I please preach behind your pulpit? You know, can I please teach? Nope. God saw it fit and said, he's called. He gave me the ability and then he gives me opportunity. Amen? That's how that works. Okay? So, the called, all right? Now... Let's go back to Romans 1.6. I want you to notice something else. He says, The called of Jesus Christ. Is that what it says? The called of Jesus Christ. It's this little word of. That means you're from Jesus Christ. It's like this. Son of God. Okay? If you have a father, like this, for instance. Simon Bar Jonah. Okay? Who's that? 
Simon Peter. You see this right here? Simon Bar, Jonah. That means son of Jonah. Okay? Um, you've heard pastor many times. Can everybody see that? Bara. Okay, that's the Hebrew, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That created, in the Hebrew, it's bara. Created, it came from. Okay, the genesis, the genus. Who knows what a gene is? You have genes, right? You get them from your mother and your father. So the word genesis, the root of that thing is gene. It's the beginning. That's why it's the book of the beginnings. Okay? So right here, Simon bar Jonah, Simon, Simon son of Jonah. Now, in English, we have a different way of saying it. Kin. Who's ever heard of kin? Next of kin, right? All right, let's take my name. For instance, my last name is Hopkins. Okay? It's Germanic. English is a Germanic language. Okay? It comes from Germany in the root of it. Okay? My name started out, this isn't to give you history, I'm just, just using my name because it works. Okay? It started out as Rob. So this man, Rob, has a son. And, his, and they call him Robkin. Okay? And then it moved from Robkin to Hobkin. Okay? And then as it moved further west into England, it became Hopkins. It shows up in about the 1200s, somewhere in there the first time. is Hopkins. So my name literally means son of Rob. My last name. All the way back to Germany, whoever that guy was. Okay? Now... So that is my ancestry, my surname, right? Now, once again, see that word kin? That's also where you get kind, the word kind. Okay, who's ever heard of kindergarten? It's a German name, German word. It means kinder, means children's garden. Okay, now let's go back to Genesis and look at this thing. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1.11. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So all the plants, they all had their kind, their genus, where they came from. Right? Notice the seed is in itself. Now look how the Holy Spirit does this. Go to 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 and verse 9. Whosoever is born of God, see the of, are manifest, or I'm sorry, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What's the seed of God? The Word of God. Defined by the Scriptures, Matthew 13, okay? Now, notice that. After his kind and his seed is in himself. That, that thing had seed in it. Alright? So the seed of God is the Word of God. Okay? Now how would you get born again? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we talked about last time, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. See that begotten? All right. You're born of something, right? Go back to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, look at verse 3. Now these are the generations of Adam. Notice once again, gene, generations. Okay? 
And Adam lived, verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness, watch this, after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters. All right? So Adam begat Seth. Look at verse 5 again, or look at verse 5, and all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Okay, that's the first time the word died shows up, as far as physical death, right there in Genesis 5.5. 5. Now, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15. So when you're born, whose image do you have? Of your father and your mother. Okay, so Seth was created in the image of his father. Adam was created in the image of who? God. Now, who is the image of God? God, Jesus Christ. Right, now go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 15. who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. He, he's the express image of God, Hebrews 1.3. Okay? So, once again, when you're born, whose image did you have? The image of your father and your mother. It's an earthly image, right? Remember this name, Hopkins? means son of Ra, right? That's who I started with, but he said you must be born again. Why? You have the wrong image. That image fell when Adam sinned. What did he lose? He lost the image. So what did Christ come to do? He came to restore that image that Adam lost. You see the reverse order? All right, to the wise all things are simple. You just got to believe the book. Look how God does things. He does them in simple fashion. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have borne the image, that means carried, of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So when you get born again, whose image do you put on? Whose image comes in Jesus Christ? All right. Look at, uh, go back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. <clears throat> and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. See the image again? Go back to 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 4. In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There's the image. Christ came to restore that image. If you're born again, who's right, residing inside of you? The Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, right? That image is restored. Now, it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we shall be as he is. Go to 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for, for we shall see him as he is. You haven't been glorified yet. You're not walking around in a glorified body yet, are you? No, this thing breaks down. It's corruptible. Christ's image is incorruptible. Right? That's why when he went into the tomb, he did not corrupt. He didn't decay. Why? He had God's blood, because he's God in the flesh. Our blood's wrong. Our image is wrong. Christ came to restore that image. So when you're born again, you're born of, 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 uh, the, of the Holy Spirit, what happens? Well, you get a new father. Go to Galatians. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Go to 
Galatians 4.4, 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God set forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. We went through that in great detail last time, and pastor uh, went through it again Wednesday night, that lineage, right? All right, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, because your sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So now you don't bear the image of your father, Adam. You bear the image of your father, the Lord Jesus Christ, born of God. Through what? The gospel. How's a man get born again? Through the gospel. The, the gospel, the grace of God. That's good news, isn't it? So we talk and go to uh, Romans real fast, 116. Obviously, we're going to get to this passage, but he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Watch this. For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What's the power of God? The gospel. What does the, what does the gospel do? It trans, transforms men from a child of hell to a child of God. Who else could do that? No one but God. Amen? Let's look at Jacob in the Old Testament as a type. Jacob's name means supplanter. He's a trickster. Stole his brother's birthright, all those things, always making deals with God. Well, God, if you do this, I'll do this. And then he finally breaks him down at Peniel, and he gets in there and he wrestles with the angel of the Lord all night. And the Lord says, what's your name? It's Jacob which means supplanter, I'm a trickster. He finally said what God already knew about him. Okay, now you're going to be called Israel, which is a prince with God. Thou shalt have power with God and with men. Notice the power. That's the Old Testament. It's a type of the new birth. It's not the new birth itself, but you can see it right there. He becomes from Jacob to Israel. You'll notice all through the Old Testament in Genesis, God will honor the second birth, not the first birth. Cain and Abel. Who was first? Cain was. Who was second? Abel. Which birth does he honor? Abel. That's a type of the new birth. Esau, Jacob. Ishmael, Isaac. Ephraim, Manasseh. Well, Manasseh's first and then Ephraim. See that? What's he doing? He's honoring the second birth. You must be born again. You see that in type? It's all through Genesis. Once again, it's the book of the beginnings. And when you begin to see those things in the scripture, you can, oh, that the Old Testament's not so boring. Right? Because you're, you're seeing these types all through the Old Testament. Okay? So, I wanted to cover that with you. Um, hopefully that helps you a little bit. Let's go to Romans We'll go to the next uh, passage, Romans 1, 7. All right. Romans 1, 7. Okay, so we understand the call of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, not just to the saved, but anybody who's listening, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of times Paul does that to emphasize they're one and the same. They're not different, they're one and the same. Okay? He'll do that in many of his epistles. Okay, where he'll say God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, they're one and the same. All right? He says beloved of God called to be saints, okay? So there's some over here. Go to Jude chapter 3 or not Jude, only one chapter in Jude. Jude verse 3, talking about beloved. Let's look at some of the characteristics of those that are beloved of God. Jude chapter 3, he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. So if you're beloved of God, you need to be contending for the faith. Amen? This thing's been going on for 2,000 years. You need to contend for it. All right? Look at verse 17. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing that beloved does is he keeps his words. 
Keep the word, okay? And then look at verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You're growing. So those that are beloved are growing in the Lord, okay? If you want something from God, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Okay? Well, what's the wisdom of God? Well, Jesus Christ incarnate, but the wisdom of God is the Bible. Okay? If you want wisdom, ask of God. He'll give it to you. It's a pure word. It's first pure, then peaceable. Well, you have the pure word right here. So you want the wisdom of God. Where are you going to get it from? Right here. Okay? Um, I was talking to Brother Johnny the other day about some of these things in the Bible. There's character types, especially in the Old Testament and the New Testament, for every character type that's out there, personality, everything. If you read your Bible and you get wisdom from the Lord, He'll show you things about people and characteristics and go, there's that one right there. There's this one. See Him coming? How do you think pastor is able to guard against certain wolves? Because there's characteristics of a wolf and there's characteristics in this Bible of certain people he has to watch out for concerning the flock. And, he, and if you're in your Bible, you'll see it and the Lord will show it to you. Now some of these things come later as you've, if, you, if you've been saved for a while and, you, and you've been doing some things and observing and you'll say, I was just reading about this guy right here. There's the wisdom of God. So he gives it to you, okay, through the scripture. Okay? All right, let's, let's continue on. Then, beloved, we understand that. Go back to verse 8. Romans 1, 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So they had a testimony. They're a persecuted church. They're in Rome. Just like the Thessalonians, they're another persecuted church, and they had a good testimony. They didn't just believe like in America, like I said before, you know, you believe on Christ here, you might catch a little flack from your co-workers, but they're not going to light the streets of Rome with your body like they would in Nero's day. So these folks were having to do things underground and they were going out and they were trying to win more souls to Christ under that uh, guise and, and because guess what, They'd get, they would literally get burnt in the streets for doing the things that a Christian is supposed to be doing under pagan Rome and then later under papal Rome. Okay? And so we see that here. So they have a good testimony. When he says throughout the whole world, he's not, this is once again an example of, of um, without distinction versus without exception. Um, just to simplify that, it's, it's not talking about China because Europeans hadn't even seen the Chinese and knew anything about them really until about the 1200s. Okay, under Marco Polo and then the, the, uh, the Islamists, they, they went over there a little bit prior to that and met up with the Mongols and found out what uh, horrible folks at Genghis Khan was. But uh, obviously, did the Aztecs know about this? Not yet. But they would. So he's talking about the known world, the Roman Empire at that time. Okay, so that's what he's talking about here. So their faith is spoken out throughout the whole world. So they have a testimony going out. People talk, right? You know, bad news travels faster than good news. That's just the way the world works. But that, nonetheless, these things are being uh, spread abroad. Look at verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Okay? Notice the <clears throat> whom I serve with my spirit. Okay? God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's your heart desire, right? Okay, you want to worship God, you've got to worship Him in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Okay, God won't take that. There's a lot of things you can do in the flesh. There's a lot of good things you can do. Let me say it this way. There's a lot of good things you can do in the flesh that are not acceptable to God. Because your motive's wrong. Okay, it's not acceptable. But He says, in my spirit. So He's talking about the spirit of man. Now it's born again. Okay, it's, not a, it's no longer a dead spirit, so he's able to do things for the Lord he wasn't able to do before, and they're getting counted uh, on his account. Okay, he says uh, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer. So every time he's, he's, he's praying, he's praying for these saints that are at Rome. Amen? He's praying without ceasing, okay? Verse 10, make re making requests, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God, to come unto you. Remember we talked about Romans 8.28? According to his purpose, according to his will, 
Okay? You just don't go out here and do any fool thing you want to do and expect God to rubber stamp it. Well, Lord, you didn't bless it. Well, you, that wasn't in the will of God. It was in the will of God for Paul to go to Rome. Okay, let's look back at, um, we'll look at Romans 15, 28 first. Romans 15, verse 28. When therefore I perform this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Okay, he's talking to the Romans. All right, so he's telling them his, the route he wants to take and the fruit he's talking about is the, uh, uh, the Gentiles giving up alms and they're going to take it back to Jerusalem. Okay, and so he says, I will come through Spain. So that was his route he wanted to take. Okay, now go back to Acts 19, verse 21. Acts 19, verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in, his, in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. Okay? So it was the will of God for Paul to go to Rome. Right? Now, he got there in chains, not a first-class ticket. And we'll see that. You, see, you can see that in the book of Acts where Paul, he's... He's purposing his spirit. He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to, he's, he's ready to die. But God said, no, you're going to Rome. You're going to Rome. Okay? You're going to go up there whether you, whether you want to or not. So God's will is going to be done. Okay? It just depends on how you get there. First class ticket or in chains. All right? Amen? Okay. So let's go back to Acts or Romans, verse 1. I love this verse here, Romans 1.11. He says, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. All right, Paul is a true minister. He's a true minister. He wants to establish somebody. He wants to impart unto them some spiritual gift, okay? Um, I'm going to use some of this from my background. Commander's intent. Operations order from the military. This is the most important thing part of an order, of an operations order, okay? And there's two parts to it, and Paul gives it right here in the scripture. You've got a task, and you've got a purpose. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? So if you've got these two things, and I tell you, and, and I give you a charge, like Paul gave the charge, you know what you've got to do, you know why you have to do it. Okay, let's look at it again. For I long to see that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. There's the task. To the end you may be established. Okay? He wasn't worried about getting the glory. He was, his purpose was so that somebody else could be established in the faith. He could help them grow in the Word of God so they could stand on their own two feet and they could begin to produce fruit themselves and produce more like them after their kind. Does that make sense? So that's your job as a Christian is to bear fruit. You're supposed to be a fruit bearer. You should be producing things and establishing other people in the faith. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 14. Well, look at here. Look at verse 12. This is the reason God gave gifts. We talked about this, I think, a couple weeks ago. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. That means complete. Unto, a, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. All right, so Satan himself walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and he has his ministers out there, ready to trip you up every time you turn around. 
And if you don't understand the weapons of your warfare, you can get pulled off into some, some pretty bad stuff. A lot of heresies, and Satan might be able to use you in a bunch of different ways. So if you don't know this, and Paul, in his intent for the Romans was to establish him in the faith, in the Word of God, because the more that you know about this book, the less deceived you're going to be. When somebody else comes along and starts spinning some yarn, you're going to say, mm, that ain't right. Something wrong with that. You ever been around that? Something just is little off of that spirit. Okay, look at Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 5. Look at verse 14. Well, look at verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. What was the Corinthians' problem? They were babes. They were unskillful in the word. They were carnal baby Christians. All right? But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So what's the meat help you do? Discern. The milk helps you grow, but the meat helps you discern. So if you don't have the meat, then you can get tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You're still a child. You're still a babe. Okay, something will come along that sounds good, and if you don't know any better, guess what? You'll get pulled off in that stuff. Why do you think God gives you a pastor? He gives you, there's a headship. He's to look over the flock. Why? He warns and he guards against these things, and he's, he carries a rod. One end's got a hook, and the other end's for beating things, right? So he can pull you back in, or he can protect you. Okay? So, but you've got to have the meat to be able to discern certain things. Okay? Like I talked about earlier in those types, the wisdom of God. You see those types in the Old Testament, and you be able to start picking things out. When people are doing certain things, you can see it in the Scripture and God will show it to you because you've got the meat. Now, you've got to have balance. You don't just want to stay on the meat and you get carried away in strange and divers doctrines. But it's important that you have that meat because why? You've got to discern some things. Okay? You've got to be established in the faith. Amen? That's why it's important to read your Bible. That's why it's important to study. That's why it's important to pray over it. Get understanding. Um, some things God gives you understanding in because you've lived it. You might have read a passage a thousand times, but you actually went through something, and that thing means a whole lot more to you now than it did just as words on the page. Amen? And so Paul, you know, you have to understand at this point, Paul's been saved for about 27 years. Okay, he's been going up and down the Romans. He's seen a thing or two. He's not some green, greenhorn sitting here saying, well, you know, I think this. No, he knows, and he knows the dangers that are out there, and he wants them to be established. Amen? Okay, so go back to Romans 1. Uh, verse, verse 11. So his, he was trying to impart unto them some spiritual gift that he'd been given so that they'd be established in the faith. Verse 12, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. That spirit bears witness. It's nice to be able to come to a place where everybody's on the same sheet of music. It's a comforting thing to know that you're around another group of a body of believers born of the same spirit Pulling in the same direction, there's comfort in that, right? It's friendly territory. Out there is enemy territory. In here is friendly. Amen? All right. He said, uh, verse 13, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. All right, so he wants to have fruit among them, all right? He wants to be able to give them something so that they can bear fruit. But look at that word there, but was let hitherto. All right, here's a good teaching point. Can you still hear me? I don't have this sounds out there. All right. Now, this is another uh, point on how some words are used in the King James Bible. Okay, this word here, in its usage, in the context, means to prevent. Sometimes it means to allow. Here it means to prevent. Okay, he was prevented. Now go to 2 Thessalonians. I'll show you the other passage where it's used like this. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. I'm not going to teach on this thing in a matter of three minutes, but I just want to show you the use of the word, how it is used. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, if you've got a Webster's 1828 dictionary, and you look, look up that word let, it will give you this exact um, example right here in 2 Thessalonians. Now, how do you know that that means to prevent in this case? Look at verse 6. And now he know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. See, the withholdeth, that's the preventing. Okay? Who's ever been taught? That's the Holy Spirit. You've probably been taught that, right? Or you've been not taught that, but you've heard those things, right? Okay, so there, there's some things going on in this passage we won't get into in 2 Thessalonians because that will take us way off course. But I want you to see that word let. You've got to be careful in how sometimes that thing's used in a certain, in a different way. And in the Old English, okay, sometimes it could mean to prevent or sometimes it could mean, it could mean to allow. See how tricky English is? That's why it's hard for people to learn it. What, what, same word. Yeah, it means something different. You got to pay attention to the context. Right? There and there. Spelled different. Two different things. I mean, it's just, if you, did, if you weren't raised in it, it, it would mess, and it still messes us up, right? Amen. Okay. Well, I'm just going to read this last passage. 114. I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So we as saved people, we have a debt to repay to lost people. Amen? Amen. Remember, debts are, are something uh, you, you're under. Well, go to Romans 4. Now him that worketh is reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Okay, you get rewards for working. Okay, and we have a debt to the lost people. Well, why? Because God was gracious enough to save me. I ought to be gracious enough and have mercy and compassion on the lost and try to win them to Christ. Because if he'll save a wretch like me, then he'll save them. That's why you got to look at things. It's hard sometimes to take them worldly physical glasses off and put your spiritual glasses on when you're looking at people that you might despise. You might say, man, I just can't stand that guy. Yeah, but they're a soul just like you that needs to be saved. And where would you be without Christ? you'd be in hell. Amen? I'll keep you straight on as far as soul winning. All right, we're going to go ahead and leave it there. And um, we'll pick it up next week in verse 15. All right, any questions? No questions? All right, well, I thank you, I thank you for your attentiveness. And we'll have prayer and we'll let you go. All right, Father, Lord God, we just thank you once again for your word and the study of it, Lord, and just thank you for folks that showed up today. Just pray that they were edified, and I, I pray that it helped them, and I pray that you'd continue to strengthen them and ground them in the truth. Pray for the service today, Lord. Just pray for the singing. We pray for our pastor, Lord, as he bring, brings the, the bread of life, Lord, and I just pray that you'd anoint him once again and just give him the words that we need to hear. And Father, we'll, we just thank you. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right.